This is a continuation of the previous message. Whose boy said, Samuel, Samuel? Not Eli. Samuel thought that. Eli knew better. He was older. So go back. Get back in your bed. Whenever you hear that voice, say, Lord, speak for your servant hears. And Samuel did say that. The Lord gave the revelation not to Eli because Eli didn't discipline his children. Huh? There's another passage on children there. He didn't discipline his children, so God didn't give any more revelations to Eli or to Eli's children. He cast them away. Well, he cast Eli's sons completely away. They were reprobate and unsaved. They committed adultery with and fornication with the women who brought sacrifices. So that's how perverse and wicked they were. And, oh, Eli didn't watch his weight and didn't confess his healing for his eyes, and he got old, fat, and blind when he heard bad news about the ark. He fell off that stone backwards and broke his neck. Why? For he was heavy. Well, you know, you don't break your neck if you're small. <laughs> when, you, when you're sitting on your neck and you weigh 500 pounds, you want to break your neck then. <laughs> Talking about sitting on your neck. There's someone who sat on their neck and they killed him. <laughs> it's in the end of 1 Samuel 4, I think, the next chapter, 1 Samuel 4, the story of Eli. Well, he didn't discipline his children. And, you know, Hophni and Phinehas, he had a couple of boys. He didn't discipline them. And so Samuel is the one who receives the revelation. We're told over in Acts 21 and verse 9, now we're not given ages here, but just listen and take it for however you want to. At least let it say what it does say, whether you want to make anything else of it or not, it's up to you. But in Acts 21, 9, we're told that uh, there was at Caesarea a certain man named Philip, the evangelist, who had four daughters who were virgins who did prophesy. Now, virgins means unmarried. I don't know if they were 16-year-old virgins or 36-year-old virgins, but they were unmarried. So you can't make a lie. You can't prove that they were teenage girls or whatever, but you can prove that Philip had four daughters that were all daughters who prophesied. They all had the gift of prophecy. Now, you as a father, can you say that of your four daughters or... Two or 18, well, that's my confession for mine, that my daughters are virgins who will prophesy. God. And we can throw our sons in there as well. And by the way, turn over to Joel chapter 2, because that's where Philip got all of his belief from and faith from. He read an Old Testament prophet who prophesied something, and he was just foolish enough to believe it. Hallelujah. That's Joel 2 and verse 28. Joel 2 and verse 28. Philip read an Old Testament prophecy, and he just believed what he read and claim this and receive the answer. It shall come to pass afterward, Peter says in Acts 2 in the last day, so he interprets from the New Testament perspective what Joel meant by afterward. After what? Well, I don't know, I guess after the crucifixion. In the last days, it will come to pass after the crucifixion that we'll have Pentecost 50 days later, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Now, I wonder if all flesh would mean just adults or children also. And your, now Joel's prophesying, let's, let's say, to adults. And so he addresses them to show them how extensive this outpouring will be. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now, I don't think he means in a separate service. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. You see what I'm intimating here? If we are claiming that we are a part of, that we are now experiencing, I know I've been preaching this whole message at the top of my lungs. Just a, I apologize for that if it bothers you tonight. Praise God. If we are claiming to be a part of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that we are saying we're experiencing this, we're living in the last days, we're in the afterword period, then he said your sons and your daughters will prophesy without a hint of separating them from the service. So what you're after, freedom for your children to minister in the gifts and your teenagers to give a testimony is already covered in the Word of God, but it's in the context of the whole latter-day move of God which won't ever violate the New Testament pattern. That's right. The New Testament pattern is divine order in God's house where you don't have the divide and confuse mentality. Your sons and your daughters, I mean, here's a specific promise that you can claim. Your sons and your daughters. He didn't say you, he said your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Well, we know it can include you because Paul does. He said you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. 1 Corinthians 14. 
But Joel said, not you, but your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Who are your sons and your daughters? Well, don't you realize, brother, that children are just a little timid? Well, so are a lot of older people, but we're not going to separate the church and then divide up into groups of three so that that timid 85-year-old can prophesy in the relative exclusion of two other people. <laughs> Come on, you know, we're not ignoramuses around here. God didn't birth fools here into his kingdom. We're supposed to be wise, understanding what the will of the Lord is. Ephesians 5.17. We do understand. We understand we base our faith on the word of God. We don't incorporate or add or think we know better than what God has said in his word. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. They're free to exercise the gifts. My children have done that. Your children, some of them have done that. Given a testimony or prophesied or sung a song or your teenagers have. You ought to expect more. You ought to be encouraged and exhorting and teaching more. And I don't know how you're going to do that. I'm sorry if this treads on some of the parents out there, but I don't know how you're going to do that if you don't set an example in your own life. Amen. You can't be expecting your child to do something you're failing in. That is simply not scriptural to expect them to live up to something you've never complied with. That ought to put the fear of God into your heart. Right. If you're not one who believes in stirring up and manifesting the gifts, most of you do believe in that most of you do do that but for the sake of those who don't we have to include that so i've really got a passage here on our side in joel chapter 2 and it's you know fulfilled in acts 2 and then it's been fulfilled in philip's daughter's lives and it should be fulfilled in the lives of our daughters and our sons as well your sons and your daughters shall prophesy praise god I just don't think it'll work any other way. I think it's going to backfire on you. That you think you can get your little group of 10-year-olds together and they'll be free to give their little prophecies and they give their little prophecies and if they're not giving their little prophecies when the big people are giving their big prophecies, they'll never have the examples to follow. They'll, they'll never know exactly how to do it or what is to be done or what to do if you don't have that older leadership around. Well, we're going to have, you know, a special brother, a special sister who's older, and they'll be in there and teaching them and encouraging them. Uh, I'm going to say again, it's not scriptural. I don't, know, I don't know how many times or how many ways I'm supposed to say that. It's not scriptural. Why, are we, why be so opposed, let's ask it this way, to road choirs and the denominational mentality of the church where you've got a pastor with an office and staff and he runs it like a business corporation? Why be so opposed to those man-made additions to God's divine order? Why be so opposed to that and then make an exception when it comes to children's church? Since that is as foreign to the word of God and to the teaching of the New Testament as any of the above-mentioned things. Why be so inconsistent in our life? Why think that we know better than the only wise God? Why think we know better than the only wise God? Now, I know something else that people will say somewhere around this point, and I've heard it before, and if you haven't heard it, then maybe it doesn't fit you or whatever, but you'll hear this sometimes from people. They'll hear a strong word like that, and, well, let me back up a little bit earlier. I said earlier that whenever I was 15 or 16, my age didn't hurt me. I mean, I manifested the gifts, and I cast out demons, and I looked for people to witness to and to win to the Lord Jesus, and I didn't think that God was any respecter of persons. And I still don't think that, because I know that he isn't. Acts chapter 10, he's not. And then people will say, well, you know, they'll tell you whenever you're 15. You know, whenever you get 30, you know, you think you're zealous now. Whenever you get 30, then you'll know otherwise. Well, guess what? I'm 30. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I believe the same that I believed 15 years ago. And I don't know how old, I've said this to you before, I don't know how old you have to get before people stop telling you that. Well, wait till you're 40. Well, some of you are 40, and praise the Lord, you're still the same. Well, wait till you're 50, and then you're 50, and you're the same. Well, wait till you're 60. It's just an old cop-out. They don't want to face up to reality. They don't want to face up to the facts. So they'd rather shame you by a reference to your age and your immaturity and to giving up your, your zealously held belief in the Word of God. They'd rather shame you into giving that up. If you're 15, don't let an adult shame you into giving up your zeal for spiritual matters. Amen. Well, wait till you're 20. Maybe their experience was they lost it by the time they're 20. So 
There's an experience I wouldn't follow or emulate. You copy the good examples in the Word and around you, not the bad examples. I had people telling me, it's a fad you're in. Well, if it's a fad, it's a long-lasting one. It's got a 15-year trademark on it now. And it's going to have a 30-year copyright on it before too long. It's a long-going one of long-standing. What do you mean it's a fad? That's just an old cop-out because you're gross in your spiritual life and you're embarrassed around some of us who aren't gross like you are. That's what it amounts to. I'm going to tell it the way it is. They're embarrassed with us. They'd rather shame us by reference to our age rather than face up to the facts in their own life that they're cold and they're lukewarm in their approach to God now. They'd rather take us to that hell pit with them than get on our little 15-year-old evangelistic bandwagon and ride with us for a while because, oh, I might have to humble myself. Rather than face up to the facts that, listen, older person, you're lukewarm now in your life. Some of us weren't lukewarm when we were 15. Some of us aren't lukewarm at 30. Some of us aren't lukewarm at 50. We don't believe in being lukewarm. Oh, we believe in it, but that's for other people. That's not for us. That's for the disobedient, the backsliders out there. We're not confessing that for ourselves. But along with that, you'll have some people say, Brother, you got any children? I hear what you're teaching about children. You're supposed to be, you got any children? And if you tell them, yeah, we have four or five or six or... Well, praise God. You got, you, got, you got them on that one. They can't say much about that. <laughs> they were hoping that you would say, no, I'm not married yet. And then they were just going to give you that smile, that old syrupy smile, that little pat on your head. Like, well, you little young child, you'll grow up and learn one day, won't you? So whenever you say, yeah, I've got Gad, I've got a troop. <laughs> then you got them up a tree there. So then they got another question, though. They'll sit there and hem and haul and think for a moment. And I know what the next one is. Any of them teenagers yet? Yeah. Oh, have I heard that one before? Because when you get a teenager, man, the devil possesses them. And you're going to lose them. You just watch it. You think your children got a halo over them? You watch it. With a confession like that, I I better be watching it. (laughs) Like the devil possesses all teenagers. No, just some new hormones possess them. That's all that possesses them. It's no devil. It's just some growth in their body and their hormones. That's all it is. Oh, my. If they find out that you don't have any teenagers, oh, here comes that smile. You can feel it coming a mile away. And that little, <laughs> that little pat on the head. Yes, brother. <laughs> you will know better when you get teenagers. Well, praise the Lord, I don't have any teenagers here. We have some people here in the church who do have teenagers, and if their experience hasn't been what I'm teaching, I bet they'll still say, but Brother Ross is right. Whether we've lived it or not, he's right, though. There's no reason to expect anything but the best in the Word of God for our children or teenagers. And you know, I can say this, and this isn't an apology, but it is something that figures into the consideration that we don't have people in this body yet because this body isn't old enough where their teenagers were birthed into this church. That may make a difference. You know, you kind of got some things against you whenever you bring a child in already six or seven and raised on cartoons and Godzilla and Dracula and you bring them into this body and then they get 13 or 14 and hey man this is hard this is a bum rap as they would say they're trying to make me be spiritual here and man I had more fun with Dracula things like that but you see we got to remember that and we shouldn't be critical of parents like that or teenagers like that because they're not going to be like I don't think and you know you believe for the best praise God I'd be believing for the best but that's not exactly the same situation as as the ideal, let's say it that way, from the Word of God. The ideal is that your grandmother was in this walk from day one. She was born in it, and her grandmother was born in it. And her grandmother was born. That's the ideal, that you go down with this faith. You stay with it. Your sons to your sons to your sons. You witness your sons' sons. And they ask those with the gray hair, Father, tell us about the old works of the Lord. See, we haven't been in this walk long enough. We don't have generation after generation. That's the ideal. We're kind of abnormal getting saved when you're 35 and your children are already 10 or 15. That's abnormal. God wants us to be saved, and then, although, of course, a child isn't birthed into this world saved, they go astray as soon as they're born speaking lies. So they have to be regenerated by the blood of Jesus. But they're taught from a young child child's age to grow up into these things and to learn the the things of the Lord. They've got a double benefit then. 
So I don't, I, I don't follow that argument, wait till they get teenagers. I am waiting for that. We've got children who are on their way to that age. But I know what the Word of God says, train a child up in the way that he shall go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. I know, you see, I've had people come and try to tell me with that smile and that pat, well, you know, we thought that, that it would work, and we had high hopes too, and and it just, you know, our children are just not quite zealous, you know, like we would hope for them to be. And, well, praise the Lord, but I'm not going to follow your experience, though. Amen. I'm not going to let that false experience affect my expectation or my faith. Amen, Do you know what that rationale is like? That's the same rationale that, by the way, some of these people have told me that they wouldn't allow used on them. That's that same rationale that that person who comes up to us and says, oh, you say you believe in healing? Yes, you say, I believe in divine healing. All the Lord, all the Lord. No doctors, no doctors. You ever had a broken bone? Yeah. Well, no, but, oh, let me tell you now. A broken bone. Now, a broken bone, you see, what happens is, and they start telling us, you got two bones, and yeah. and they will not mend together if you don't get a cast set on by a professional, blah, 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 blah. And we tried to believe in blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to follow someone's example of unbelief and failure like that. See, they think you, they have you on something because you haven't experienced it yet. Well, have you had it? No, I haven't had it. Do you have teenagers? No, I don't have Well, let me tell. I'll let you tell me your experience as long as it lines up with the Word. Amen. Then I'll rejoice with you because I want my teenagers to be just like yours. Amen. But if yours are wicked, I don't want to hear your testimony then. <laughs> I don't want mine to follow. I'm not going to follow the way you did then. You did something wrong. You did something wrong. I'm not going to follow your way. I'm going to follow God's way. Well, my children, we had great expectations, just like you do. You're starting off young, and we were in the same place. And praise the Lord, I don't have all the answers or explanations, but I'm not bound to do that. I'm just bound to raise my own children. I don't know what's wrong with you or your teenagers, but I'm not concerned about that. I'm not going to follow that example. Now, that may sound like, well, he puts his head in a hole in the ground or up in the clouds so I can't see it. It can sound like whatever it sounds like, but we're not told in the Bible or encouraged to follow other people's examples when they don't line up with the Word. For whatever the reason they don't. I'm not trying to blame anybody for the faults. I'm just saying I'm not going to follow that example. I'm not let the, going to let that minister to me because it doesn't. It doesn't edify me. Amen. All that will do in you is create fear in you. Like, well, what can you do then? If there are other godly spiritual people around who had children born right into this walking movement and who grew up and forsook it or who grew up and were more or less lukewarm, apathetic, they left their first love, Revelation 2-4 type people. Well, I'm not going to follow that. I'm not going to receive that on my children or my life or my teenagers. I'm not going to receive that. Amen. So you see, it's, it goes back to the same simple thing. as I'm only going to receive what's in the Word, not additions or subtractions to or from the Word. That's right. I don't want to listen to somebody's arguments against the Word that try to discourage me or create doubt or unbelief or fear in me concerning healing because I haven't experienced that trial or concerning raising teenagers because I haven't experienced that blessing, I won't say trial. I'm sure it's a little different than raising children. I won't know what it's like until I do it. But that's why I have the Word of God to give me godly counsel on that. Because I've never done it before. And you can talk to other people, but you still got to do it yourself, though. And you have to get your counsel from God, the great counselor, the Word of God. I believe that all of God's people who will obey the Word, live the Word, operate in faith, and refuse to hear contrary testimonies, they'll be successful in raising the children. Amen. Praise the Lord in raising the, the adolescents. Now, if you get them out in the world and let them play around with the world, then they're going to get burned and you're going to get burned and everything in the process. But that's why that we teach the Word of God and we try to take and make the safeguards and keep the children away from the world and away from worldly, secular, public schooling influence and so forth and away from the television set, which is an ungodly source of influence, Amen. and away from worldly neighbors and worldly friends then they won't learn all of that. God knows what he's doing. You know, I, I know some Christians out there, charismatic and otherwise, who have had terrible experiences with their teenagers. And you know what? They never even think to trace it back to the fact that they sent them through 12 years of atheistic schooling, 12 years of incredible peer pressure, 12 or more years through addiction to television, and they wonder, well, I tried it, it didn't work. Well, there's some good reasons why it didn't work for people like that. Amen. You sank your ship before you ever got out of the dock Amen. with things like that. Amen. See, our children don't have any of those influences. Amen. 
They just don't have any. Now, that's the negative approach. You can take all those influences away and still have renegades as children. You've got to replace that with something positive like godly counsel and godly love and holy living before your children. You've got to give them something, not just take something from them. And if you'll do both of those things, I'm sure that God knows what he's talking about. I'm sure that Proverbs 22 will work for us just like Mark 11:22 will work for us. I'm sure the Word of God will work. I've got confidence in God's Word. My faith is in God's Word. Train up a child in the way that he shall go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. He will not depart from it. We don't let our children... We don't have a television. We don't want them watching television. We don't want them watching television when they go to relatives. We don't let them watch television. They don't go to school. They don't play with neighbor friends if neighbor friends are unsaved. They're playing together. We've got a lot of neighbors who are here in the body because we live close together and they can play with those friends. But... Not other friends. We just don't let them play with neighbor friends. We don't want that ungodly influence. Now, take that with a grain of salt. I mean, that doesn't mean that, you know, you've got to tell the neighbors get out of here or put a big, huge 18-foot fence up between your yard to keep them away or something. Uh, There may be whatever, for whatever reason, an occasion for some playing together or whatever until whatever happens. I'm not going to try to iron all that out for you, but you ought to be wise enough and mature enough to know what's going on. If I see a neighbor friend over your house next week, I'm not going to be critical of you or something. I just assume they know what they're doing. But we don't even have any neighbors around us anyway. We live way in the woods, so praise God. Just got the wildlife around you. Well, we got one family not too far from us, but they don't they haven't been down since we moved there. Didn't serve us a dinner the night we moved in or anything. All neighbors used to do that back in the good old days. But I think they know that we're religious, so <laughs> that does something to your neighborly relationships. They've never visited, never called, and, you know, well, going on a year, he's been there. We've never even seen him or talked to him unless you happen to meet him out at the mailbox or something or up the hill at the mailbox, out in the woods, wherever it is. Praise God. You know, I think that what we are seeing in the charismatic movement, I'm going to move beyond now these three points that I've just given you here, arguments that people will use in favor of children's church. I think that what we are seeing, what we are now witnessing, I hope that all of us don't take this message lightly like, well, there goes Brother Ross. He loves to preach against denominationalism, and there he goes again tonight. I hope we get this in our heart very deeply, that God has us over a barrel when it comes to wanting to go up in the first fruits rapture, and that is that we have to be blameless before him. And the way that we're going to be blameless is we're going to be obedient servants to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his work. We're going to recall the fact that the Lord Jesus is the chief cornerstone and he is the builder of the house of God, the church of God himself. And he's going to build it with his own heavenly divine specifications. We better not add to it. It's like God said to Moses in Exodus, build everything according to the pattern that you saw on the holy mount. Don't add to it. Don't diminish from it. Build it exactly according to specifications. And Moses did. He didn't add a do-wrong skin or a piece of shitty wood that wasn't specified by God Almighty as God gave him that revelation. See that thou do all things as it was shown thee in the Holy Mount. We better do that in building God's house now, God's church, the living temple made out of living stones. And I think that what we're witnessing on our hands today is more a product of the age in which we live, the age of divide and confuse, the age of divide, dividing up age groups, the age of over-specialization, the age of the cult and worship of the child, in America anyway. What we're witnessing is much more a product of this age than it is of the Bible, the Word of God. You know, it's only in this age that we see such division and confusion. School, now there's kindergarten. Now there's pre-kindergarten. Now there's pre-pre-kindergarten. And I think that you can even find such things as exercises for the child in the mother's womb now. There's a little bit of everything for all the different age groups. We need to make sure we're not picking up something that's more a product of the spirit of this age than it is of the teaching of the Word of God. We have given you some teaching before in Christian ethics how America right now is experiencing the cult of the child, where the child is worshipped, he's photographed, he's put on display, he's given everything his little heart desires. He throws temper tantrums if he doesn't get it. He gets his allowance of $52 a day for 
uh, doing nothing or next to nothing. He has his own psychologist who helps him work out his six-year-old problems with mommy and daddy and them saying, no, no, little Billy or little Bobby or little Billy June for what you're doing wrong. You're not supposed to say no, no to them anyway, but they got their own psychos now that their parents pay the shrinks to come in and tell their children what they should or shouldn't be doing or help them cope with life's problems. We've got all of this around us. And so what do we have now in the church? The religious counterpart. We should witness that. We should recognize that, what's going on around us, the religious counterpart. Back in the good old days, you know, the Indian mothers, they took their children with them on a papoose everywhere they went. They didn't have a babysitter for for them. They worked with them. (laughs) The Eskimos still do. You see them carrying their babies around with them, their children around with them. Now you send them off. In church, you send them off somewhere. When you go to the job, you send them off somewhere. I know that it seems like we might have some weight against us or some authority against us because there's this person or that person and they believe or they're saying that brother, reverend, teacher, pastor, so-and-so said that it was okay to do children's church. But, you know, I'm not going to believe brother, reverend, pastor, so-and-so if God, the great reverend, said no, then it's no. If God doesn't give us children's church in the word, then I'm not going to follow brother, reverend, sister, prophet, and so-and-so then. I'm not going to follow them. We just believe that, you know, you know, you know, you know, and they just go down. Well, you know, well, no, I don't know. I, I, it's beyond my comprehension. I'm a New Testament disciple, not a 20th century church member. New Testament disciples follow the New Testament. They follow the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2.42. They follow what Jesus taught, that he would found the church, Matthew chapter 16, and that we better not add to it or diminish from it, Revelation 22. And we better make sure that we're not a product of this age or we don't allow ourselves to be influenced by people who are influenced by the spirit of this age that is around us. I just wish people would sit down and think. Some of them have received teaching against the cult of the child and child pampering and child worshiping. And it's just something that uh, it's beyond me to even think to comprehend how you could set up a program where you separate the body and you get the young people and you've got church-sponsored bowling activities and church-sponsored pizza parties and all this. If you want to have a pizza get-together, then get together. But you don't have to call it a church-sponsored bowling party or hang gliding adventure or whatever it is you want to go out there and do. The church is the ground and pillar of the truth where the saints of God come together to worship their Lord and receive the instruction from the Word of God. It's not some babysitting or child care facility here. It's where we come to worship children, old people, in between people. We come to worship our Lord and receive instruction and teaching from the Word of God. And if we don't have it presented like that, then we're not going to produce any better than we are. We're going to have that same spirit of weakness and apathy and playing around with God's Word. We're going to have that same spirit produced in the children or the young people that we see manifesting through the older people. Well, I believe the Lord just has a special calling on my life. Well, you're going to have to give us chapter and verse for a special calling as a Sunday school teacher or a children's church minister. God gave us the ministry offices, and he didn't give one to children. He gave all of them, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Those are for the older people. Those are for the children. Those are for the in-between people. And why we can't get in our mind, we overcomers, we people who are claiming to follow this whole world, why we can't get into our mind the fact that we don't have any support in the word of God for this? Why we, we can't get into our mind that if we just look around us, we're witnessing in America anyway. Well, you're witnessing it almost in China now today. We're witnessing the revolt of the youth and revolt in such a degree that now the adults are participating in it by pampering them rather than giving them a little slap on the rear end and saying, now you either shape up or ship out here. You get in line here. We're going to do things the way God says. We're going to do things the way Papa and Mama say to do it. Not the way little Billy or little Billy Sue says that we're going to do it. We're going to do the way Papa and Mama have to say. Papa and Mama have final authority as Papa and Mama exercise their authority under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I think maybe I've gone long enough this evening, and I think we'll probably pick up with this again. I've got some more things to say because we haven't really had the time to get into the Scriptures concerning this matter. What the Scriptures say about children, what the Scriptures say about the children's 
uh, relationship that they are to have to God's holy nation and God's holy congregation of people, whether Old Testament Israel or the New Testament assembly, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is clear teaching in the Word of God. There are specific indicators in the Word of God that would lead us in a certain direction concerning this whole question. I mean, in one regard, the Bible's silent. It doesn't say anything about children in church. But in another regard, it does have something to say that it's wrong. And it says it by implication that there is something else to be in its place. And that's what we're experiencing here in our body. Well, we don't have a separate time. We don't have a separate time on Wednesday night for the children. We don't have a separate time on Friday night. We don't have a separate time on Sunday morning for the children. We just don't have a separate time. And I don't think that we've been hurt by it. The children either come and sit and learn, or they come and sit and learn to sit. <laughs> they come and something happens, I know that. They either come to learn or come to learn to sit to learn, to sit to learn. Amen. And while they're getting one, they're not getting the other. But eventually they get both of them, sitting and the learning. Amen. Praise God. I think we'll be the better for it in the long run. Amen. But I have some things maybe a little more personal for our body as well as for the other bodies concerning our children that we'll get into next time then. Praise God. So the error of dividing the church by age groups is just that, an error. It's not going to send a person to hell or something to believe that, but I just think that common sense should reign in this regard and consistency should reign in this regard. That if we have received truth in so many other areas, we receive it one way through the grace of God on our life to take the word of God for just what it said, then let's let consistency rule in our life then and throw out whatever's not in the word of God. Throw out, cast out the bondwoman. We don't want the bondwoman. Her child shall not be a partaker of the inheritance. He's not an heir. Cast out the old bondwoman of institutional religion and cast out her children what she has produced as well. Amen. We're children, we're supernatural children. We came from a supernatural birth. Amen. We're a part of a supernatural walk here. Cast out all that's of the flesh because it doesn't please God. Whatever's in the flesh is against God. It's opposed to God. It's enmity against God. It can't know God. It can't know peace because it's against God and God is against it. Jesus was against tradition of his day and tradition was against him and tradition put him on the cross. Jesus was against it. We're his disciples. We are against it as well. And if people say, well, what's a big deal about it? Then, well, I could say two things. Next first, next time, we'll show you what the big deal about it is. But secondly, we could say tonight, yeah, that's right. What's the big deal about it? Why would you create what wasn't there? We're not the ones making a big deal about it. You are. You created what wasn't there. Now you're making us take an extra night out of our schedule to address it. Amen. It's not our fault. That's your fault. Yeah, we wouldn't respond. We agree with you. What is the big deal about it? Why'd you invent that? What's the big deal about it? Get rid of it. It's not in the Word of God. We're only addressing it because you're the one who made it up. As one of the brothers used to say, you know, people would say, you know, why are you spending so much time on one topic? Seems like you get a hobby horse there. Well, he said, if you're building houses and leaving the doors and windows out, we better start talking about doors and windows then. We're going to be in a heap of trouble if we build houses and leave all the doors and windows out. The reason we're spending so much time on the windows is because people are building so many houses without any windows. We're not talking about the roofs. The roofs are already there. We're not talking about the foundation. The foundation is already there. We're talking about the windows. We're talking about whatever you've left out or added that's not supposed to be there. We're talking about wherever the blueprint has been violated. God's holy New Testament pattern, the blueprint. We're talking about that. We're talking about what you're talking about. We're talking about what you invented or what you subtracted. That's not our fault. That's your fault. That's the devil's fault working through you. But there's forgiveness, there's grace. There's only grace and forgiveness if we'll receive it from God and his word by getting in line with his word.
getting man's ways out of us and men are busy getting God's ways out of them it's almost as though God's giving us the, the grace that used to be on the world he's certainly giving us extra grace bountiful grace he pours out on us to see these things and to receive these things in our heart and in our spirit have our mind convinced of them from the word of God it's such a blessing not to be like an old bridle horse not wanting to go where the master wants it to go pulling and twisting and turning and pawing the earth and doing everything hurting itself you can't hurt god we're only hurting ourselves. we don't obey god god loves us and he's our father but we only hurt ourselves whenever we don't obey him and submit ourselves to his yoke and his burden which are easy and which are light but that doesn't do away with the fact that they are a yoke and a burden a burden and it's a yoke because it's something that he puts upon us to make sure that we endure to the end and to make sure that those paths that we walk upon are paths of righteousness for his namesake to make sure that those pastures that we partake of are green pastures and not dry and barren ones which always would speak of man's ways the husks of denominational ways and to make sure that those waters that we dwell beside and drink of are not raging rushing torrents but still waters still waters which speak of the blessing of god's holy spirit the blessing of god's grace on our life so he puts that yoke and that burden there to direct us into the straight and narrow way but straight and narrow if it's straight and narrow straight that means it's difficult to enter and few there be that find it and we're going to have to have the master with his yoke and burden upon us which is his word and the leading of his Holy Spirit through his word in order to get into it the straight and narrow way in order to get into the passageway and to gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven and that's our desire to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand people might never think of 
repenting over something like that, but we have to repent over all of our perversions of God's pure and holy way and word. Repent. We have to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We want to enter that kingdom. If we want to enter that kingdom, I believe we do, then we have to repent of our evil ways. And set in order, if we don't, God will just put the axe right at the root of the tree and just throw it into fire. Men gather those things to be burned, Jesus tells us in John 15. And if we're not going to be burned, then at least we're going to be purged from the unscriptural ways that are clinging to us. But I find it refreshing and I find it liberating because I have something that I can place my confidence in. I have something upon which my heart can be founded so that it truly, as the psalmist said, will not be moved. And it's only in the rock of God's word, the rock of God's word, the stable word of God, the stable word of God who lives and who abides forever, and his word never changes. That is something upon which we can base our faith and our life and our convictions so that none of them will move. Praise the Lord. comfort to me to know that Amen. there's Amen. scriptures like that in the Bible. So I don't, I don't have to listen to what everybody else tells me of what happened to their children. I just refuse that. I close my ears to all of that nonsense and defeat. God said he'd pour his spirit out up on us and upon our seed, his blessing upon us and upon our offspring. Well, I don't know any way to take that except just what it says. That means he'll pour his spirit out and he'll pour his blessing out. 
That means upon your seed. I guess that means your seed. Whatever your seed is. I don't care who they are, where they are, what they're doing, what they're not doing. I guess that's what it means then. I don't, I don't know any way to take that if I don't take it for what it says. He's going to pour his spirit out upon my seed, your seed, and bless my offspring and your offspring. Amen. Praise God. Now, if that's true, then there, there aren't to be any counter arguments about teenagers or whatever. That all evaporates under the word of God. Amen. Under the word of God. That's right. That's one of those lies of the devil where he tries to rearrange things and, you know, misquote or misapply Psalm 91 or whatever. We just don't receive that. Amen. And you know what? If I were standing up here tonight and I had four 15-year-old boys and six 16-year-old girls and they were all just as lukewarm as could be, I'd still be confessing what I'm confessing now. I might not be here as your leader with children like that, but I'd still be confessing it even sitting out there. Wherever I would be, I'd still be confessing it. I'm not just confessing this because things are going well for me. I'd be confessing it regardless. That's the only way things will go well for you. If you'll take the word of God, Isaiah 44, 3, and confess that and believe that. See how simple it is? Our church is built on simple truth. The Bible is simple. It's simple what the Bible says. I'm going to believe that. I receive that. I don't receive anything else that's contrary to that. I'm going to call that a lie and say that it has to rearrange itself and get in line with the Word of God. I don't receive it. I don't believe it. Praise God. Hallelujah. So I hope our faith has been encouraged to shore up the defenses in our family and in our home. Shore those defenses up and be more obedient and more zealous and holy and godly in that regard. 